Thank you. It's uh, certainly an honor to fo follow such uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, Reno, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, and Anita. Um, I certainly learned a lot in the last uh, 30 minutes about cloud in India. I'm not really here, obviously, to talk to you about cloud in India. I'm just a visitor. I'm going to try and give you uh, very quickly, and I realize that I'm the last speaker between you and dinner, so I'll try and use your time efficiently. Um, and I'll try and allow some time for questions at the end for all three of us, all three of us. But I'll try and give you very quickly a brief status report on cloud in the government in the United States. And then I'll talk about some of the policy issues that have arisen from cloud and online privacy regulation in Europe. Uh, before I do that, let me very briefly say what is SafeGov. Uh, don't be misled by the name. We're not part of the government in the United States. Uh, you, some of you might have thought that we are a nonprofit organization. And our purpose is, you could say our purpose is to offer advice to governments. Uh, there's no guarantee that they listen to us. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. We were founded in 2011, and really the, the historical reason for our creation was as a response to the Obama administration's Cloud First initiative, which has already been alluded to, and I, I'm sure many of you in the room are familiar with Cloud First. Um, I'll, I'll ver sort of very briefly go through that history. There was a, a very well-known man in the United States, Vivek Kundra, who was the federal CIO under Obama. President Obama gave Mr. Kundra his marching orders. Uh, and I, I don't think President Obama, I, I mean, he's a good politician. I don't think he personally is very interested in technology. It just came out the other day that he doesn't, he hates social media, but it doesn't matter. He, he gave Vivek Kundra marching orders. He said, do something dynamic with the IT infrastructure of the federal government, do something that saves money. So Vivek Kundra produced uh, a very well-known white paper at the end of 2010, uh, which was the Cloud First Initiative. And it basically said, as the word suggests, uh, to any federal agency, which is like your large ministries, if you are considering a new IT investment or if you are considering updating an existing IT investment, you must consider, as a matter of policy, as a matter of mandate from the White House, you must consider cloud first among the alternatives. You may choose something else. You may find that that's not the right solution. And he gave them a deadline. He said by the middle of 2012, you, each agency, you must have at least three applications that are either on the cloud or in the process of moving to the cloud. He didn't say which ones. He had some ideas. Uh, he didn't say how much you have to spend on them. But he gave them the, that top-down mandate. And that was really very important. Uh, in, in getting cloud going in the United States. But our organization, SafeGov, safegov.org, and I invite you to visit our website. We, everything we do is published on our website, and we have a lot of material up there. We were created because it emerged very early on, exactly as in India, that, that these large federal agencies, which have a lot of autonomy in the United States, they're, they're kind of like elephants. They're very large, they're hard to move, and they have a mind of their own. And they have a fair amount of autonomy in choosing their IT investments. They're not completely controlled by the central government. They're part of it, but they, they kind of do what they want. But it very quickly emerged that security and privacy were major concerns and even major obstacles to adoption of cloud services by these agencies. So SafeCub, really, we have a lot of sponsors, commercial organizations that are interested in promoting cloud in the public sector, government, broadly speaking, but also schools, and other public sector organizations. So our job is really to de develop best practices and learning experiences which address these issues of security and privacy and try and clear the road to cloud in, in the broader public sector. And as I say, we're not part of the government. We work closely with a number of government agencies in the United States. We spend a lot of time talking to government regulators in Europe. They know everything, and before you say, before you even want something, you want a cup of coffee, your virtual servant says, sir, would you like a cup of coffee? I have, would you like Arabica beans? Would you like Robusta beans? What, what kind of coffee do you want? Do you want a, you know, Starbucks uh, latte? Are you going to buy a, it will know I want to buy a car. It will know I want to buy a house. It will know I want to go on vacation. It will know I'm really embarrassed about something I did, you know, with a friend six months ago. It will know all of that. It will make proposals to me, and I won't have to pay this virtual butler, this virtual servant. It, this virtual servant will remunerate itself by taking a commission on everything that I buy. I mean, that's basically the model of a Facebook or a Google. I mean, there was a piece of research out of Cambridge University 
in the UK just a few months ago, which showed that the statistical analysis of likes in Facebook allows you with an 80 to 90 percent probability of being right to guess um, the gender of the person, the age, the political beliefs, the religious beliefs. You know, are you Christian? Are you Muslim? Are you Hindu? Are you Jewish? Um, are you what kind of, you know, what kind of, poli what is your financial status? Do you own your own home? You can make all kinds of inferences just by analyzing the pattern of your likes. And same is true of, you know, Google reads your Gmail. They know what websites you're visiting because of the double-click cookies. They can build a very accurate model, and they're, that's what they're doing. It's big data. They, they know where you are from your cell phone. Apple knows where you are with your iPhone. Google knows where you are with your Android phone. Microsoft might know where you are with your Windows phone. They know all of this about you, and they, they, they're making all of these inferences. But the Europeans are saying, this business model is legitimate if, if you tell the consumer what you're doing and if you allow the consumer to say no. Um, because today, we in the IT industry understand what Facebook and Google are doing and Twitter is doing the same thing. But the average consumer probably only has a very vague understanding. And I realize I've got about three minutes, so, and then I'll conclude with a video here. The average consumer does not understand really what's going on. I mean, you know, Facebook, Google, all of these services are free, but we all know from Milton Friedman, uh, famous University of Chicago economist, uh, my alma mater, this, there's no such thing as a free lunch, okay? So really you are paying, and in the case of these free online services, you're paying in the currency of privacy, the, you're paying in the currency of information. So what the Europeans are saying is, the internet companies, especially the U.S. internet, they have to disclose that bargain. They have to disclose that transaction in a more honest, transparent way than they have until now. And they must allow the consumer to say no, either completely or partially. Um, and now, now the, 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 the internet companies have the right to say, well, we're not going to give you this service for free if you don't want to give us your information. Fine. That's a fair transaction. But they, they have to let the consumer, maybe the consumer would like to have some control over how much they disclose. Maybe the consumer would like to know what Facebook knows about you and maybe say, well, that part, erase that. I don't want you to know that. But this other part is fine. I, I am buying a car, actually, and I, I do want to have some good offers. So I'll conclude here with a video uh, from the ACLU, which is the American Civil Liberties Union. And uh, let's see if I can do this right. Uh, uh, I think I'll get it. Okay, I'll, I'll go to Chrome. Okay, so this, this before I play this, and, and the American accent goes by pretty quickly. This is about a man who calls a pizza shop and orders pizza on the phone. And the woman answering the phone says, okay, she's looking at a computer screen, and it turns out she knows a lot more about this man than he realizes. So that, and this is obviously a fictional scenario, but it's an, it gives you an indication of what might happen uh, in a worst case uh, dystopic future. So after this video, which lasts about a minute, I'm going to stop and we can have questions, or if there are no questions, we can all, you know, go in and have dinner, but up to you. Um. Pizza Palace, guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number as 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Corp, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for this. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67 even. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could pay $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine Combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks, so they're very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just 
bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh, but I see you checked out the budget beach bomb at the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout sauce. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. Man, I'd say Toko and Sprouts is, like, required. That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness Magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, clip that and it's $19.99 even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? Want to stop this from happening? So we have time for questions, not just for me, but for Renu and Anita, for the previous speakers. If there are any questions, if not, um, do I see any takers? Okay, please. I'm putting, putting three applications uh, on cloud. Uh, one of the objectives, because you, any mandate has to be driven by certain objectives. One of the objectives which I could gather uh, was, of course, the tight budget or uh, optimization of the cost which federal government was spending on IT. Uh, what was the second objective? It can't be only one objective. Of course, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean, there's two answers to that. One is that when Vivek Kundra wrote this document, in some sense it was a political as well as a technological initiative. And in some sense, it was designed for the way it would be perceived as well as for the way it would be implemented. But nevertheless, I mean, he was certainly no fool. And, and he very well understood the benefits of cloud because he'd been previously the CIO of Washington, D.C. And so he really did careful, I mean, he did a careful review of what the benefits were. And, and it would really be what, what Rena and Anita said, Renu and Anita, am I pronouncing it correctly? I hope, pardon me. Um, it was the, the traditional benefits that we've all heard about cloud, which is scalability, flexibility, adaptability, pay as you go, um, the ability to, to take risks by starting up IT projects quickly without having to buy a lot of infrastructure. Um, I mean, you can go and review his document. It's still on the, on, on the White House website, uh, even though he's, he's moved on. He's now actually he's now working for Salesforce.com, I think. Um, so that's a sort of that would be uh, the answer. More questions. Hello. Yeah. Uh, very good evening. Uh, I am Rahul Jain from DSCI. Uh, you said that you know the in the US, uh, uh, the clouds may not be hosted outside US, uh, but in the cloud first policy, and we have gone through that. Uh, I didn't find any specific mention of that, right? So that's first. first. And also would like to know uh, 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 Madam Renu's view on uh, clouds being hosted outside India for government usage, maybe for non-trivial applications. Right. So you're absolutely right. Cloud First said absolutely nothing about the geographical location of the cloud services. And indeed, in most cases, US law does not require. I mean, it does for things like Defense Department for intelligence agencies, but really, OK. So whose fault? I mean, how did this happen? Really, in some ways, I, I blame Google because Google was the first to offer a government cloud. And they probably did it because they knew that they had a credibility issue being an internet advertising company. So they, they wanted to get the government business. So they said, OK, government, we'll build you a cloud. And unfortunately, many of the US federal agencies have accepted this offer and demanded that the other vendors do the same. And the other vendors are doing the same. But actually, the law does not require them in most cases to do it. So maybe Renu can answer for. See, there are two things. One is my view and one is the government's view. But let me tell you one. Uh, as far as uh, having uh, the data hosted and using the pr uh, public clouds, even for low risk kind of an application, there are a couple of things before. I mean, this can be put up in a concrete way by the government. I mean, there's nothing that's closed from the policy's perspective. But as I said in my initial talk, that we do have two groups, one of them which is looking into the legal and regulatory and the cross-border. So that group definitely, they are working, and we are awaiting the report and the inputs of that group. 
which will be fed into this particular. That's one important aspect that uh, I think will give us a kind of a answer as to how do we take it forward. But even, so you know, because I do not know way back if you've seen, uh, you may not have even MHA, Nita can correct me also, the guidelines which are available from MHA that the government website cannot be hosted outside India is what's available. I mean, that's the level at which initially it's. So I think uh, there is a whole lot of, uh, I mean, concerns and things which the other group is looking at to, I mean, address this data location. And as far as GI cloud is concerned, definitely, uh, whatever uh, comes up, and the policy doesn't really restrict that kind of a thing. Thank you. I also have a question. Please. See, uh, you talked about uh, US uh, using uh, basically cloud uh, email of uh, the Google or those from the collaboration point of view. My question is, while you, uh, I mean, uh, the, UK, uh, the U.S. trying to use it. Mm -hmm. Well, the U.K. is quite concerned on the online privacy and those things they're trying to. What about the U.S.? Because it's not a low risk also. If you have your government emails, everything available on a public cloud, there's a whole lot of documents as a part of the email. Right. And you showed your slide which talked about Google and all. They are into the advertising as the data mining is definitely. So which means there's a concern, how is that being addressed? Well, you said the FISMA and all is there, but in reality, I mean, are the uh, departmental users given that kind of an option? Uh, I mean, right. because I lately somewhere, maybe you could uh, help me in uh, knowing this, I heard Google is coming out with something like a single privacy policy, uh, right. which is, uh, so that also becomes a big issue if that is not adaptable to the end, uh, these are some concerns even the UK is having per se. Right. So maybe... Uh, Those are uh, all very good questions. Um, I'll try and sort of pick them apart. For the Google privacy policy, that what you refer to is what they did last year where they collapsed all of the privacy policies from their many different products into a single policy. Um, and basically, it was an admirable effort. I mean, they were trying to be more explicit but it also had some negative features because essentially it gave them the right to take information from any of their services, not just Gmail, but YouTube or their ad serving, double click, and to combine it to build a bigger profile of you and to target you with ads. And again, as a consumer, that may be a fair, they have very good internet services. So as a consumer, that might be a fair bargain. But if a government agency or a school contracts with them, it's not such a good bargain. So the question, the European Union immediately launched an investigation of this Google privacy policy from last March. And it, that, actually that investigation is still going on. Um, the, basically, uh, the two sides, Google and the European Union, have like that. They have not been able to agree on, Google says what we're doing is fine. We don't understand why you're bothering us. And the Europeans say, actually, you're not obeying European law and you need to change. So. It isn't clear how that's going to wind up. There's probably going to be some fines issued against Google in the next few months. What happens after the fines is unknown at this time. But in, in the United States, if you go back, first of all, the 500,000 email seats, both Microsoft and Google, uh, this is not the Department of Defense. This is not the Pentagon. This is not the CIA. This is not the White House. These are the agencies like the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Transportation, which are using these email services. And you do have some examples, uh, this issue of what about the in malicious insider risk in the data center in, in one of these organizations. So there's really two answers to that that the government is, is pursuing. In high, in, in high risk, in applications that require a lot of protection, and, and for example, law enforcement, SafeGov in the United States has been involved in helping local police departments adopt cloud computing. And if you, I'll just take a minute to explain one example. A couple of years ago, three years ago, you had the city of Los Angeles that contracted with Google for 30,000 email seats. About half of these were for ordinary city workers, water department, 
Parks Department, things like that. The other half is for the Los Angeles Police Department, LAPD. The half that was for ordinary city workers, that deployment went very well. They saved a lot of money. They were able to shut down their servers and their data center and, and, and move the staff to some other function. And they, they went from $200 a year to $50 a year per user. But un the, unfortunately, the part, the 15,000 seats for the LAPD, that part had to be canceled because in the United States, every police department is local, but they have to access the national database, the crime database of the FBI, which has all of the fingerprints and the criminal history. And the FBI has very strict rules. If you have an IT system connected to our database, it must comply with certain rules, and especially not just the technical rules like, you know, malware scanning and all of the obvious technical requirements, but also the FBI requires that the data center personnel undergo strict background checks. Are they criminal? Are, are they trustworthy? And, and Google, and, and to be fair, it wasn't just Google, but the other cloud providers did not meet those requirements at that time. So that's why Los Angeles, to you know, great embarrassment, had to cancel um, the deployment to the LAPD. And actually, the CIO uh, ended up losing her job because of that, partly because she should have known, and Google should have known, that they didn't meet these requirements. But so our job at SafeGov, we, we organized an event with the FBI in January. So basically, the solution to this, and, and these vendors are beginning to comply, the solution is expensive for the vendors and a little bit painful for the vendors, but the solution is to have very rigorous background checks on all of the personnel employed in the data centers who might have logical or physical access to the servers. Um, and that, uh, you know, Microsoft has done that. Google has not done it yet, but I, I think they will. Uh, they have no choice if they want to serve the, the law enforcement market in the U.S., which is quite big. It's probably potentially 500,000 seats, ultimately. But there's another possible solution, which is doesn't take the place of background checks of the data center personnel. But that other solution is encryption, where you have a number of new startup companies funded by Silicon Valley venture capitalists. And one of the very interesting company named Cypher Cloud. I think it's spelled C-I-P-H-E-R Cloud, Cypher Cloud. Some Indian entrepreneurs, well known. You can look it up on the web, cyphercloud.com. They and a couple of their competitors, there are a half a dozen of these companies, what they do is they, they have a, basically a box that sits inside your firewall and then encrypts all of the email that goes to Office 365 or to Google Apps. And so the email that's on the Google server is encrypted. And, and you have the keys, not Google. So they, even if there is a malicious insider, the malicious insider can't get access to, um, to the email. So this is a new technolo technology answer to the security problem. It's not yet, uh, the policy and the regulations in the U.S. are not yet in place to make the federal agencies comfortable with this. They're still checking it out to see, does it really satisfy our requirements? But it's a possible answer in addition to this very expensive uh, process of, of background checks of data center personnel. So that's a, a partial answer. Now, we think at SafeGov, we think that this encryption in some cases is, is a good answer to the data sovereignty problems. Um, I mean, I'm sure the government of India is never going to send its sensitive defense or intelligence information outside of the borders of India. But you, like, like the U.S., you have some government ministries where it might be efficient to have it reside in a data center in Singapore, maybe owned by WIPRO, who knows, um, or, or, you know, in, in, in Dublin, in Ireland. And maybe encryption could be an answer as well as uh, background checks on the data center personnel. Uh, Dr. V.K. Saigal, my question is to Dr. Neeta Varma. Is there any, uh, actually belong to BPCL under Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, is there any PSU or uh, ministry putting their application cloud in India? Yeah, if you're talking about private cloud, that means which is set up within an IC data centers, as I told you, there are around 200 uh, pro projects which we have moved on to cloud in the last one quarter. A lot of panchayat information systems which are coming up, even the panchayat enterprise finance and all, that all has moved on to. Quite a few government, dial.gov, we run the service, that runs from the cloud as of today. Data.gov, which is our open data program, that runs quite a few, uh, around 200 and odd projects which we, which is running from the private cloud which we run as NIC operate. 
Maybe we can take one more question, I think. Uh, Jeff, hi. Uh, this is Anubhuti from Wipro. Here. Oh, there you are. Uh, my question is that, you know, you've uh, spoken uh, all about cloud and how federal U.S. Uh, government deals with it. But I would be very keen to understand what is your policy initiative towards the disaster management? Thanks. Okay. So I can answer that only indirectly. It's not SafeGov being, you know, we kind of have tunnel vision. We sort of see cloud everywhere. But I mean, my, my, my short answer would be, I mean, there's two aspects. One is, I mean, cloud, obviously, if you have one of these large cloud providers with many redundant data centers, which they all do now, you have a form of built-in disaster recovery with that redundancy of data centers being outside your own organization. Having said that, you have to ask, what is their disaster backup plan? Um, and that, I think, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to give a long answer, go into technical details, but I think that one of the benefits of dealing with these very large vendors is because they are so large, they have very sophisticated infrastructure, architecture, and expertise, and I mean, I, this is a cop-out, but they, in general, are able to provide for, for, in many ways, better disaster recovery and protection than even a large corporation, which doesn't have the scale of a Microsoft or a Google or uh, an Amazon. Um, that, that's not a good answer. Um, I realize that, I admit, but it's the best I can do for now. Um, should we conclude on that? Uh, Ravi, I don't know what the...